All right, all right, everyone. Come on in. Come on back to your seats. I did forget to give one super important detail about if you're giving to this campaign, if you're like different than your normal offerings. If you're doing it through the app or online, um, there's categories. And so um, general fund is where all of our tithes and offerings go. Missions is a different kind of an offering. It goes to our missionaries. The special one is for this getting ready for company campaign. So if, if you haven't given your gift yet um, and it's going toward that, uh, just click that special drop down when you have the chance to do that. If you did it and you didn't know about that, just email me and be like, hey, I meant that for special and we'll get it all figured out, okay? Sorry about that. That's on me. Now, um, we're, uh, we, started a, um, we started a series last week about having a new orientation. And let me just give you a couple quick bullet points that you need to understand where I'm going today. So let's pray and then let's go ahead and I'll, I'll share some of these backup points with you. God, we know that you are doing something very rich and very powerful in each and every one of our lives. And so we see it taking place at the church level, but we know that's because you're doing something in our hearts. And so whatever it is, we just ask you would do more of it. Help us to become more like you. Help us to find areas of our life that are not sub submitted or not surrendered to you so that we can surrender them and we can be people who live led by your spirit. Jesus, when you ascended, when you left this planet, you gave us your spirit so now we all have access to you at all times of day. We are in you and you are in us. And so may we be guided by your spirit in all things that we do. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so I talked about having, like everyone has an orientation. Like, and what I mean is that's your baseline. Everything's normal and that's, you're oriented to that. And so that's what feels normal and good and right to you. And then something happens, something big will throw us off. It could be big, it could be little, any kind of change. And I went through like 25 different kinds of changes last week, but something, when something different comes and disrupts your normal flow of life, you're now in disorientation. And then that disorientation period is really tough. It's tough on us, it, it feels like everything is off, it feels like God is distant, and you know, so we talked about that and what it feels like and how difficult it can be. But God uses it to lead us to a new orientation where we've grown, where we learn to experience him differently and better, where we are more fruitful, we look more like him from the inside out. And so it's a really important thing because you're experiencing life and God in a fresh new way. And so finding that new orientation, though, it's not automatic. It doesn't just happen because it happens. And so how we handle disorientation really matters. And in the parable of the prodigal son and the loving father, the younger son in that passage entered into... He went through disorientation, and then he, he went all the way through it and entered that, found that new orientation by allowing his humility to outpace his arrogance, which is something that we all should keep in mind, and then he chose character over company, because for a while, he made company with people who didn't have good character, and they didn't help him grow his character, and they spent all he had, and then they left him, and so sometimes we do that. We make company with people who do not have the kind of character that we have or that we're desiring to get to, and it actually gets us into trouble and moves us further away uh, from who God is wanting us to become. And then the third thing is he started making, he started praying prayers like make me someone instead of prayers that are give me something. And I think give me something is the lowest level of prayer, and I think make me someone is the deepest level of prayer. So that's, that's the younger son. He's kind of the screw up of the story, but he kind of gets things figured out. And then Today we're going to look at the back half of this passage because there's another son and Jesus has some things to say about him. So if you have your Bibles, uh, you can turn in or turn on to Luke chapter 15 and we're going to read just a few, a few verses here and get, get the vibe of the, uh, the, young, or the older son. So verse 25, this is Luke 15, halfway through this parable. Meanwhile, the older son was in the fields working. When he returned home, he heard music and dancing in the house and he asked one of the servants, what was going on? Your brother is back, he was told, and your father has killed the fattened calf and we're celebrating because of his safe return. The older brother was angry and he wouldn't go in. So his father came out and begged him, but he replied, all these years I have slaved for you and you never once refused, oh, and never once refused to do a single thing you told me to do. And in all that time, you never gave me one young goat for a feast with my friends. 
Yet when this son of yours comes back from squandering his money on prostitutes, you celebrate by killing the fattened calf? His father said to him, look, dear son, you have always stayed by me and everything I have is yours. We had to celebrate this happy day for your brother was dead and has come back to life. He was lost, but now he is found. There's a lot happening in that passage, so much. So I want to, I hope to unpack uh, most of it in the time that we have today. Uh, but there's some, there's some important things I want you to see about what I'm calling, so I'm calling this the nasty orientation because you've got your normal orientation that's comfortable and normal. You get disoriented, and we saw that with the younger son. He was in that disorientation, and then he got to the new one. However, sometimes our orientation, like what's normal to us, can kind of get nasty. And as is the case with the older brother here. Now, if you start to feel attacked, just know that I myself am an older brother. So naturally, I fall right into this category. And yeah, it's not just older brothers and sisters. I will look at all of you and say that. You need that reminder. But sometimes it's us. We get this idea. We get this nasty orientation. How do we get there? What is it? We get a nasty orientation when we, when we let disappointment drive us. Now, life can sometimes bring disappointments. We all understand that. Things don't go the way we want or hope or expect. We're blindsided. But when we start letting disappointment like be our main driver and our main motive and our main mood, it can create this within us. And it gets marked by rudeness, by cynicism, by complaining, judgments of others, bitterness, manipulation, a selfish mindset or entitlement, as we see right out in the forefront with this guy here. And this, honestly, everything I've just read to you, it's a, it's a description of a toxic person. And so we can get there if we get disappointed and we stay disappointed, and we allow disappointment to become our overarching character. And I think that's what, now this is a parable. This is not a real person. Jesus is using this to show us and give us a, a story to teach us what the Father is like. And I want to illuminate what God is like in this, because he still loves us through our nastiness, which should make every one of us in here say amen. Thank God for that. But I want to also extrapolate some ideas for you, because this does affect us your spiritual life will become debilitated and you will become oblivious to all the Father has given to you and done for you if we get into that nasty orientation. So debilitated, meaning that as evidenced by the fact that this guy was judgmental, he was critical of others, he was jealous, bitter, envious, angry, even rageful at times, and marked by emotional immaturity. Honestly, those are physical manifestations of a debilitated spiritual life. And so it reads a lot like some of these lists where Paul says the acts of the sinful nature are obvious. We see in this younger or this older son who'd been living with the father the entire time, even though he was in his father's presence, he did not match his father's attitude or character. And so there's some danger that we need to pay attention to. And we can become, in the nasty orientation, we can become oblivious to all the great things that God has given to us because we become ungrateful and we become discontent. Now look at this gentleman here. You never once gave me anything. I did everything for you. Essentially, I slaved for you. I never told you no. That's ungrateful. And it's entitled. This idea that you owe me. You're giving something great to this kid who's a screw-up, and yet you owe me. And there's a discontentment within that. And those things, that, uh, that, that lack of gratitude and that discontentment, if we start to see that rise up in ourselves, I would just say those are red flags that we need some help and we need to be honest about where we are at spiritually. I'm not gonna tell you that you're failing. I'm not gonna have any judgment for you. We are human beings and things just go awry sometimes and we don't recognize what happens within us. But if you see these things in yourself, pay attention. Don't pretend that they're not happening because we need to deal with these things right away. These, I would attribute these things spiritually that I've just mentioned to you, like if you're having uh, chest pain and a crushing feeling on your chest and shooting pain going up and down your left arm and things like that, you know immediately, I gotta go to the doctor, this is serious. I would say the same thing. If you start to notice yourself being discontent, if you start to notice yourself being ungrateful, those are serious symptoms that things are not okay spiritually that will affect every other aspect of our life 
and every other relationship that we have. And here's the big point, aside from what I've just been saying to you about this. Look at this young man. The point I think we can take away is that you can be in the family of God, you can even do things God wants you to do, but be completely unlike God. That should sober us. You can be in this church, you can work, you can, you can raise your hands in worship, you can be loud in worship, you could be, you could be the one who prays longer than everybody else, you could lead a Bible study, you could be involved in kids ministry or youth ministry or a greeter at the front, you could do all these things and yet still have hatred in your heart toward other people, that's a real problem. It means that we have made the outside appearance of our faith more important than actually being a follower of Jesus. This is trouble. Jonah is a perfect example of having a nasty orientation in scripture. If you have not read that book, I would encourage you to do it. It's only a few short chapters. It's in the Olden Testament. Uh, for those of you, it's on the, it's on the front half. But um, I'm not going to read it, but I'm going I'm to um, I'm give you the Brian's short version of it today. There was this once upon a time, although it's true, this happened, once upon a time, there was this horrific city of Nineveh, real bad city, um, super immoral, terrible place. And uh, it was outside of God's promised chosen people, Israel. And so God expressed his, wanted to express his love for those people. He wanted to redeem those horrible, horrible people who did not know God and did not act like God or, or love other people like God at all. They had the opposite the opposite life that God wanted people to have. So God goes to Jonah, who is one of his chosen people, an Israelite, and he says, I want you to go and preach repentance to Nineveh. And Jonah, Jonah was bothered that God even hinted at redeeming those heathen people. And so he got offended by God's request, and he went the opposite direction, hopped on a boat when he should have taken a, taken a road up north to land, hopped on a boat, and uh, ended up in this horrific storm, and they throw him overboard, and he gets swallowed by a, a whale for three days. Now, it's also an interesting picture of redemption. God is about redeeming humankind. That is his main mission. Everything God does has been to get everyone on this planet to know him. Dr. Frank and I were just talking about how interesting it is that we weren't doing a great job getting into uh, Islamic countries, and so all that unrest has brought Islamic people to places where now we can get to them, and then you hear stories of, was it Mustafa? Okay, about a guy like him who what, we weren't going to reach in Afghanistan, but we did reach in Austria. It's interesting because God is about redeeming people. So Jonah gets offended by that. He gets swallowed by a fish, which is exactly what happened to Jesus metaphorically. He was in the grave for three days and then comes out and, and, is, and, and humankind is redeemed. Jonah after being in the fish for three days, figures out, okay, yeah, this is bad. I'm in the wrong. And we've talked about this. How long, how, three days inside a fish? Underwater? Why so long, dude? <laughs> like, that's a stubborn streak. That's all kinds of stubborn right there. Impressively stubborn. But he comes out, he obeys, he goes to Nineveh, he preaches. The entire city, from the top of the government all the way down, repents. They literally, like, uh, enact laws, civil, civil ordinances, to repent. Everyone, stop what you're doing, put on burlap, get ashes on your head, cry. I, like, I don't cry on demand like that, and it's law now. Like, we got to figure this thing out. They, like, they were serious about their repentance. You'd think Jonah would be like, this is amazing. He was so mad. So mad, because he went up on a hill and was like, now burn them down, God. They're horrible people, even though they're repenting. They're horrible. They deserve judgment. Light them up. Nothing happens. And he gets so mad at God for not judging him. Is that not a picture of a nasty orientation? And all the while, he starts complaining to God about how he's so uncomfortable because it's so hot, so God provides shade, then he takes the shade away, and he's like, just kill me, God. <laughs> like, flaily like that. It's in the scripture. It's in Hebrew. So, but the idea, it's all this ungratitude. It's all this lack of gratitude and this discontentment and this entitlement I'm chosen, which means you aren't, and therefore I'm better than you. That is not the heart of God. The heart of God is, I chose you because I needed to start with humans. You're no better. That's what the chosen people means. You just go. Do my, do, get out there and tell them how great I am. You've seen it. Now share. That's the idea. When we get in church, 
and we think, look at how good my morals are, my friends. I have really lived this straight and narrow life. I'm crushing it. My siblings are all a mess. They are such a wreck, and I, I pray for them. And please, yeah, please pray for them too, but, but I am really, I'm really super amazing because I'm in church. If we have that attitude, we've got a nasty orientation. If it's anything, I would just say, if it's anything other than gratefulness, gratitude that God saved us, he saved me, essentially I'm a lucky one, because he wants to save everyone. He wants all of us, every human being, no matter what their, whatever defining factor you want to come up with are, however they are different than you, he wants all of them redeemed. He wants them to come to the place where they say, Jesus, I need you. That's it. If we get the idea that, well, I'm in church, so I'm amazing, and you're not in church, and your life is a wreck, that's not the right attitude. That's not God's attitude. So it's easy for us to be in church and do good church things, but miss God's heart. And I want to be so specific to you that watch out for that. Let's not have that. How we handle disorientation matters. Jonah didn't handle his disorientation very well. This older brother didn't handle his orientation very well. And here's the thing about the nasty orientation. It makes us blind to ourselves. In Luke 15, 29, the son says to the father, I have never refused anything to you, and you never gave me even a goat. Now, that's, that's kind of rough, isn't it? Like, now for me, I mean, I grew up, I had a goat, so I don't want to brag, but I don't relate to his complaint there. I tried to find a picture. I couldn't find a picture. It's at home. So I'll show you one next week. Side note, I had a goat. But um, actually, we had three goats. But so this guy must be really, really hurting if he didn't have even one goat. But it's the idea that he's mad that you're, you're doing this great thing for this, this person over here, and you never gave me anything. But what does the father say? You have always stayed by me, which means that is the most important thing. He had money all by himself. Money is easily, it's perishable, not relationship. The moments you have with people, the moments you have with God, they may be spent, those moments, but you don't lose those experiences. You don't lose God's word into your heart and soul. Those things are not lost. And when we get to heaven, none of our stuff comes with us. We know this. What goes with us? We go right into the presence of Jesus. That's the most important thing. We are in God's presence so this relationship is so important. And then on top of that, he says, and everything I have is yours. Meaning, I love you. You should have known this. It was abundant. I didn't kick you out. Are you ever going to move out? But, you know, he didn't say that. But he was like, which means at any point in time, you could have just had a goat. You could have had three goats like Brian. You could have done anything with all of it. I always wanted to give you a goat is the point. And sometimes we look at God and, and we're like, why does this person get that? and I don't get this. Why do they get that stuff, that person, that relationship, that career, that blessing, and I don't get? I think it's because deep down we're a little bit, we're a little bit ungrateful, and we're a little bit discontent, and we don't recognize what we already have in Jesus. He had all the wealth, and more importantly, all the relationship with his father, but he was blind to it, and that's what the nasty orientation does. And his father's presence and relationship were far more important, and he missed it because he was out doing in the field. And it's easy for us to get wrapped up in doing things for God and forget to be with God. Both are needed. I would say that being with God is the first and highest priority, but if you're just a beer with God, you're also lazy. So we need to also do for God. That's what this mission is. That's what, even in our church, and we get all that. So when disorientation hits you, be keenly aware of all that you have. This is an important moment when disorientation hits, when, when, when you get the call or you get notice or whatever it is. At some point, I would say in that first 24 hours, do your best to take stock of every good thing God has given you. All your possessions, all the incredible experiences you have with God, all the lessons you've learned, your relationships, these are important. Because you're putting your eyes back on what God has already done for you, which helps you see God's going to get me through this. The other route is God hasn't done anything and I'm just here by myself and I'm upset and God owes me, but he's not, he's not paying up and that's not the orientation we want to be in. This helps you to embody gratitude and contentment 
which repel that nasty orientation's blindness. So we often try to fix hurt on the inside by doing things on the outside. If I get stressed, I get snacky and I want to shop. Straight to sour candy and Amazon. It's a, it's a real problem at times. I'm working on it. But we do this. Some of us, it might be those things. You might just want to talk about others so you don't have to focus on your problems. You might create drama elsewhere so that you forget what's going on at home. And we do things on the outside because we're, we're trying to fix something on the inside. But we're doing it wrong. We're doing it in an unhealthy way. And so gratitude and contentment open our eyes to what we already have. Interestingly, too, I want to point this out. Blindness is one of the things Jesus hated in the religious community. Part of what I find so ironic about Jesus' ministry is that he healed many actually blind people. He restored sight and vision to people several times. But there were some who watched it all take place who wouldn't see what they had become and who they had become. And so they are seeing, but they are blind spiritually. They didn't even recognize these incredible miracles were being done by God's own son, who they had been searching scriptures for years and anticipating and waiting for him to show up. And he's right in front of them, and they don't see him. They just see, you didn't come like I thought, like I expected you would. Therefore, I don't believe you. Even though he's healing blind people. Like, I'm at that age. I would love to bump into Jesus and not have to wear contacts or readers anymore. That'd be amazing. But I have sight. Sometimes, though, we don't have sight about certain things, but we act like we see everything. And so, how has Jesus helped you to see the true you lately? When has the Holy Spirit revealed to you something that you need to deal with in your own life recently? I'm not going to get into it right now, but I, I was doing some coursework and I was reading about a different leadership thing uh, for a course, a class I was taking. And, um, and I read, I was reading things. I'm like, oh, this is interesting. You know, this, this, it's, it's good reading. It's good fun. And I got to one chapter and it was as if they had broken into my mind and were literally reading like, I, I was reading about myself, why I make certain decisions, why I get into certain conflicts, and I was like, oh no, <laughs> like, don't, fear, literal fear, how could this be me, but it was me, and then it was like, I can't tell anybody, I don't want anyone to know about this, I, I'm so embarrassed, all of this, and it was the Holy Spirit in a, in a quiet, alone moment through a book that I was, I was given as a textbook, figuring out that there's a serious emotional limitation in my life that I need to work on which I have been, and that's felt great to do. I was blind for 44 years. I was talking to someone recently. Yeah, and they were like, I'm 62, and I'm dealing with the same thing. I was like, at least we're learning, right? Like, she's 62, I'm 44. We haven't, we haven't finished yet. So, but we need those moments. I was blind to something that was limiting me. It was a limiting factor in my life. I think we all have them. Not necessarily mine, but we have them. How is Jesus helping you to see the true you, even the parts of you you don't want to see or acknowledge? What is he revealing to you? And, it, and is the Holy Spirit helping cure your blindness? Because I honestly believe this is what God wants to do for every single one of us. Are we like the blind man that he healed, or are we like the blind religious leaders that wouldn't listen? When we read these stories and we hear about them, put ourselves in them. What is Jesus trying to say to me? And so this nasty orientation, it blinds us. But you can fight that blindness, and God wants to help you see through it. But you have, to be able, you have to be willing to look in the mirror to do it. Here's the second and the last thing here. The nasty orientation looks in the wrong direction. This older brother was looking at what others were doing instead of who he was becoming. This other, this other son of yours, not my brother, this other son of yours, wasted his money on prostitutes. And you're throwing a big party for him. That's all you, 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 you. He didn't see who he, how he was acting and who he was acting like. He didn't see how nasty he'd become. And when his brother left, I think, now of course this is a parable, but I'm, I'm inserting myself in it. As, an older, as a former older brother and looking at my younger brother, you just have to, you just, the bar is only as high as your younger brother is. So you really only have to be a little bit better than him and you're good. You're still the best one in, in our own, in my own pathetic childhood mind. 
thinking, yeah, I mean, if I can, if I can go, if I can do a couple more pull-ups or push-ups or do this or that. So his brother leaves and the bar gets lowered. He doesn't try anymore. He has no one to compete with. There's no sibling rivalry. So his attitude sags. His, his drive, his motive, his, uh, all, the, um, all the aspirations he has, that bar gets lowered for all of it. He didn't think about becoming his best. He only thought, I just have to be better than the younger. And right now, that bar is very, very low. It is so low, I don't have to do anything. And he could develop this nasty attitude. That is all called comparison. And I would just tell you, I'm going to ask, has any of you ever compared yourself to anyone else before, ever, at all? <laughs> have you ever heard of it? A couple in the back? Yeah. Me too, with my brother, just that once. Um, but comparing ourselves to others causes us to compete with them. And I'm fine with competition when it's organized competition. But when we start looking at another person like, I have to beat you, there's, there's issues there. If it's just normal life, I'm so bad at this on the road, I'm not going to get into it, but no one knows that I'm racing them. And I'm <laughs> constantly winning. It feels so good in my life. Like, and there's always like the, who are you? Like, yeah, because I want to know. I beat you. I beat you. All right. We don't need that in the church, though. We don't need this competition in the church. Because what it does is when we start seeing people as people we need to compete with in life, it brews up this weird combination of pride and judgment and self-righteousness. Now, I want to just be honest with you. I can't find any of those attributes in, in any virtue list in Scripture anywhere. They're never listed as a good thing. Good job, you're arrogant. Good job, you're judgmental. Good job for being so self-righteous and condescending. Jesus never tells us to become and to do those things. Unfortunately, the nasty orientation just lets it happen. Comparison sickens our souls. It poisons our purpose. It corrupts our character and it mutilates our motives. It rots our relationships. And I have no one to match with joy. It's the thief of joy. I wanted to say carjack joy, but it didn't work. So. But it does not lead you to become your best self. Comparison does not. Comparison leads to jealousy, which is the belief that God owes you. And jealousy is a spiritual problem that must be dealt with from a spiritual place. And if you're, if you're, if you're Dylan and other, anyone else who's coming with him, you can come up now. We're going we're gonna to wrap up. Comparison, jealousy, the blindness, all these things I've talked about today, but I want to focus, I'm, I'm going to put it in, in the category of jealousy, but this, this works for everything. It's best dealt with by a prayer of surrender. You've heard me say that a couple times already because I'm learning that, that the spiritual life following Jesus, if you want to boil it down to one word, it's about surrender. Me finding an area of my life that is not surrendered to Jesus, and therefore I need to surrender it to, to the Spirit and allow His Spirit to work in me to produce the fruit of the Spirit. I can't do it on my own. I have to surrender myself, or as Jesus said, die to ourselves take up our cross, and follow him daily. And so this is how I see it happening. So years ago, uh, when I was in, I was still in uh, Bible college working on my bachelor's, and um, I was, I, Andrew and I were newlyweds, and I was a, I was a youth pastor, and um, so I, I was already in my career field, and I'm working on my degree, and I'm loving being in chapel, and all this, I'm learning about the Bible, and I feel like I'm thriving. And I, I, I brought a friend with me to help, help build this youth group, and, and it, we were both immature back then compared to who we are now. Um, and just some things were done, and they really, really hurt me deeply. And I didn't, I ignored it. I didn't deal with it. I just mushed it to the side and tried to push on through. And I didn't realize that I became bitter and jealous toward them. And so when I talk to you about how these things are like major symptoms of like your spirituality getting crushed and killed, it's because I've done this to myself. I've allowed it to happen. The problem is I was deceived because I was learning. So I'm learning, but I'm not growing spiritually. I'm doing things for God, but when I would get with God, he'd have me look at how I'm responding to this other person, and I was only mad at the person, and I wanted God to do bad things to that person, and he didn't feel like doing it. He was trying to fix me, and so we disagreed, and so I would move on to go do something else for God. And so it was a real, it was a real mess. It was a lot of immaturity. A couple, like a year goes by, and so this is becoming full-on bitterness. And I'm at an altar, which is the front part of the church, 
And we call it an altar because that's where things go to die for worship purposes. But when Jesus sacrificed himself on the cross, he rose again. And when we sacrifice pieces of ourselves on the altar, like the, part, like the bitter part of me, the jealous part of me, the hurt, I didn't even realize it. I just went up to the altar to pray. I had a whole other direction in my mind. And the Holy Spirit was like, let's deal with your bitterness over this person. It's not you. This person, there's no one there. And I was literally like, why are we talking about him? And then I saw it. Then I saw, I, I am bitter. I am jealous. How did I miss it? And then it was like, you know, I was blind. So we need those moments of surrendering these things to us. So we're going to do that now, just for a moment. Will you stand, please? And um, Gina or Delaney or Rick or somebody, can you, can you drop us to a worship, a worship lighting? Questions for you. I'm going to invite anyone and everyone to come up here and to pray. And I want to just pray with anyone I can while you're here. And if you want to pray with someone, please do. The questions are, what blindness is the Spirit revealing to you? Is there anything that you, you have been missing about yourself? People have been trying to tell you, God has been trying to show you, and you've been ignoring it and blind to it. Let's surrender it today. Have you been resistant to seeing the things in you that hurt others or elevate yourself in an ungodly way? And then have you been comparing yourself to anything? Anything at all? When I talked about comparison, you were like, oh yeah, that's me. When I talked about blindness, you were like, okay, yeah, there's, there's something going on. Dylan and Bethany are going to play. I want to invite you to be in a moment of prayer, and I want to invite you to come up and be at the altar. If you have something to surrender, surrender it here. Let's pray and accept what the Spirit can do in you. So let's take a moment of worship. Will you guys lead us? Come on up if you want to come surrender something. Lord, we submit ourselves to you. We surrender ourselves to you. Any blindness, any comparison, any issues, any, just anything going on in life that we recognize it's not something that you brought or built into us. We're going to surrender it here today. And we are asking you to take it and to put into us what you really want us to be. Give us your character. Give us your heart. Give us what, give us what we need to be in you. Let's continue to pray and worship. Jesus, we surrender all of ourselves to you. We surrender today because we know in you it's safe. It's gone. And you can bring these dead parts of us to life. Fill us today, all of us in this room, with your spirit. Help us to be people who look more and more like you in every way imaginable. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you're here praying, please feel free to stay as long as you'd like. Uh, if not, thank you so much for being here. Hope to see you next Sunday. God bless you guys. Have an amazing Sunday. You're dismissed.